Okay, folks, so we've had a fascinating uh, set of issues being discussed. And uh, now we're moving on to uh, some of the sector issues. And to guide us through, we have uh, four presentations um, this afternoon, one on health, one on education, uh, one on uh, broadly the ethics of uh, aid in this area, and one on uh, rural development land administration. And I'd like to introduce uh, Jasmine to you from uh, Birkbeck College, uh, University of, of London, who's been working for uh, quite some time on this, has worked also with Unifem, uh, Ford Foundation. Further details on the speaker profiles. Jasmine, welcome. Thank you. Okay, so um, my, my paper draws on the, um, the, the paper some of you might have picked up. It's still in draft form, but it's about the reshaping of women's health in the context of public-private partnership. So obviously I've got 10 minutes to just very much skim over it, but uh, do feel free to ask me um, in, in the break. And um, I have the advantage of coming now, so some of the issues have been raised already. So um, the, the kind of focus, the context of my paper is about this change in development landscape and the growth of public-private partnerships in the health sector. And the, the paper the, uh, before lunch uh, laid out some of the concerns and issues about, um, you know, particularly from a gender perspective, you know, some of, some of these concerns we need to have. Um, and... and um, for example, in the health sector, people do talk about the McKinseyization of health in, in development, so the way that these kind of um, corporate organisations are becoming involved and reshaping things. And also, um, the influence of the MDG ag agenda has, has been quite critical in, in sort of reshaping where donors are directing their money, um, and, and that's important too. But there seems to be very little analysis from a gender perspective. So what I've tried to do with my colleague, Fenella Porter, who unfortunately couldn't be here, is to look at these, the gendered implications of these and also what this means for women's health, which I will define in a minute. And to try and sort of focus on some of the intended but also the unintended consequences of these changes. So just to very briefly summarize, uh, 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 sorry, define what I mean by gender equality. I mean, again, people have talked about gender mainstreaming, and I think one of the issues in, in gender and health is, is it's not clear what we're actually mainstreaming. Um, so this is how people have defined, or the, the WHO have defined gender equality. And obviously what's critical is about looking at the power relations. So I, I won't read it out for you. But also um, a very broad definition of what we mean by women's health. So again, it's kind of looking at the social relations and, and looking at power relations and looking at women having voice and agency in how they define health rather than just a very sort of medicalized understanding of what women's health is. Um, and, and obviously, you know, one of the big challenges is how we capture this kind of notion of women's health and gender equality in, in, in health and development. Um, so as we know, there's been this growth of public-private partnerships in the health sector, and one of the things this has done is led to the concentration of donor funding into specific areas, and, and again, people are very, well, I imagine people are, are very familiar with the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. And um, while there's been quite a lot of analysis of, of these, and one of the main arguments is that it's kind of reinforced vertical approaches to healthcare rather than more horizontal approaches, uh, which has been debated, um, but one of the, the main shortcomings is that there's very little analysis of the gender dimensions of this. But one of the things these, these global funds have done is um, led to tensions between donor priorities and country priorities, and, and one study has argued that um, ODA to maternal and newborn health is not being targeted to the countries with greatest need. And 16 of the 68 countdown to 2015 priority countries have actually seen a reduction of donor funding in this area. And these include Brazil, Congo, Ghana, and Burundi. And again, one of the other critiques has been that um, actually, even though in, in some instances we see an increase in, in funding to reproductive health, if you actually look at where the funding is being allocated, a lot of it seems to be going to, um, to reduce or, or, or to looking at HIV AIDS, which obviously, of course, is a big issue, um, but it's not the only issue. And, and some people have argued that it um, reinforces this marginalisation of, of broader women's health needs. And, 
one of the things we did in our study, which we talk about in the paper, is um, to interview NGOs in the UK and looking at where they are channeling their funds. And, um, and, and one of the, the stories that someone told us was um, how in a particular country where they had a project, you know, project reproductive health, all the money was going to male circumcision because that, that was kind of the, you know, the, 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 the uh, issue of the moment and, and nothing, none, of the other none of the reproductive health funding was going to anything else. So you know, this, this is, is clearly of concern. And it's not that it's not an issue, but it's not the only issue. Sorry, this is a lot of uh, stuff on this. Um, and so one of the things that, that we argue in our paper is that this, this whole attempt to meet the MDGs and, um, and, the, uh, and that's been reinforced um, by the growth of public-private partnerships um, is this reductionism around women's health. And it comes back to the point Karen made this morning about this tension between instrumentalism and, um, and, and more kind of nuanced rights-based approaches. And what we argue is that this focusing on the targets has led to a sidelining side of the wider gender inequalities within both societies and health systems. And one of the things I argue both in this paper and elsewhere is that health systems themselves are gendered institutions. And we need to take that on board and look at what that means in different country contexts rather than just focusing on improving women and girls' health. And that we need to, under, uh, to integrate this into our understanding of, of processes in health policy and practice. But what we see in a lot of development assistance or a lot of health work in general is that women's health becomes a proxy for reproductive health and particularly maternal health. And there's a, a, a failure to kind of acknowledge not only other uh, reproductive health issues that affect women and, and particularly you know, those associated with, with later stages of life, um, but also broader women's health needs and, uh, and that there's a, again a gap between um, women's health priorities and, um, and, and what, what is the focus of the MDG target. So for example, um, the choice of target five, which is um, a, about the uh, availability of, of skilled birth attendants. I mean, one of, the, one of the critiques that has been made of this is that actually um, it, it doesn't recognize the local context and that what we need is to, to look much more at how um, skilled birth attendants have been trained, how this has been regulated, what is actually going on in different country contexts and this kind of labeling actually hides quite a lot of the reality. So while countries might meet the target, actually, you know, the, the, the reality might be quite different in, in, in who, who is performing. And also that in some instances, you know, people who are labelled as non-skilled actually do um, possess certain skills that are useful in, in, in the area of, of, of birth and delivery, um, when, you know, which they perhaps um, learn on the job and, and gain from working with other more experienced and more skilled professionals. But, but none of this is actually reflected in the targets. And again, um, you know, others have suggested that uh, the availability of emergency obstetric care would be a better reflection of overall functioning of health systems, but it's been discarded due to lack of data availability. But again, critics have argued that this too um, does not reflect inequalities of access to care. So I think, you know, we just need to recognise that what we need to look, or what we need to somehow bring into this discussion and debate around targeting is some understanding of the local context. Um, and it's not to say that, you know, uh, developments around women's practical needs haven't occurred. There's been, you know, some, some improvements in, in bringing more female doctors into health services. But that in and of itself is not sufficient because um, it doesn't necessarily address the broader gender inequalities in medical education and, and society. And, um, there was an interesting study that was conducted in, in Sudan that found, yes, there had been an increase in women doctors, but what actually wasn't happening um, was uh, uh, overcoming discrimination within medical training, where it was often assumed that you know, female medical students and doctors didn't want to go for further training to increase their specialisms because of their family and caring responsibilities. So just because you might meet the target of bringing in more women doctors, it doesn't mean that we're addressing the wider gendered inequalities. And again, I think... Um, uh, the, uh, while I agree family planning is important, I think, again, there's certain tensions between this kind of instrumental approach and, and the rights-based approach around um, contraceptives. 
contraception. And, and in 2007, clearly there was, um, you know, some input from women's activism, etc., with in terms of the introduction of the of Target 5B, which included the contraceptive prevalence rate. But uh, when we look at kind of the way in which public-private partnerships have been involved, I think we see that there's tension between measurable income, measurable indicators, sorry, and the creation of new markets for health projects. And again, the paper this morning kind of alluded to this in the, in the um, expansion of, of, of sanitary products, for example. And it's not clear that the most appropriate forms of contraception for women are actually being um, prioritised. And what um, certain bodies of evidence suggest is that there has been this shift towards oral and injectable methods of contraception, which require screening and follow-up care for possible side effects. Yet, these kind of services, as in follow-up services, are not available through the PPPs. They're not funding this. So, you know, I think this, this um, does raise important concerns. And the indicators do not always um, reflect, sorry, that should have, reflect women's uh, broader social, and, uh, sorry, sexual and reproductive health needs. For example, unneed met for family planning does not include women and girls not in couples. So again, there's very sort of clear messages coming through about what is and isn't acceptable behaviour for women. Um, and of course, it doesn't um, even touch upon the whole question of sexual rights and the fact that in you know, a significant number of countries, abortion is just not an option for women. And also, again, you know, the availability of contraception does not automatically empower women. Just because women have access to, uh, to contraception, it doesn't prevent women from being raped or being co coerced into having sex. So again, you know, this emphasizes the need to, to look at the wider social relations and what's happening there and that we need to yeah, look at, uh, at the uh, gendered social relations in, in family planning in order to start to address these issues. Um, so how are, are women's voices and, and women's agency incorporated into this whole sort of public-private public -private partnership um, trend? Um, and um, one of the areas it seemed that women's voices were definitely excluded was in um, looking at how funding is distributed at the local level, so sort of how the, how, um, the global funds are, are, are sort of disseminated downwards, and that what studies have found are sort of hidden transcripts of power in funding distribution, so who does and doesn't get invited into these, um, into these meetings. And that less powerful organisations are often excluded from country coordination mechanisms, yet the, the kind of organisations that are excluded are frequently those that have very detailed knowledge of women's realities. And what happens to women's voices? And it's not clear how they're represented in, in high-level decision-making processes. So what seems clear is that we need better links with women's organisations and women's health movements and we need approaches that bring together the medical with the social. And again, there's studies that have shown that women's participation in community organisations can lead to better health outcomes, for example, in lowering um, maternal mortality rates. And a study here by Prostatel, they, they, they looked at um, community participation, sorry, women's participation in Bangladesh, India, Malawi, and Nepal. And they found, you know, groups that worked with participatory strategies inspired by Paolo Freire, um, so it's kind of, you know, about education, but, but self-empowerment, um, and, and recognising that health problems were rooted in powerlessness and, and working towards social and political empowerment. So these kind of broader um, kind of programmes that, that really did look at social relations were much more effective, and, and the kind of key message their study came out with was that health education is more empowering if it involves... If it involves dialogue and problem solving rather than message giving. So a very sort of different kind of approach. So we need to sort of look at how women's organizations are actually being brought into these. And, uh, and again, I think there was a, somebody mentioned before, you know, the need to fund these, uh, Karen, and I think that, you know, the need to fund these organizations that, that's just becoming increasingly overlooked. So, um, yes, so policy recommendations this is my final slide. So yes, we do need to, um, a, you know, support closer links between women's organisations and movements. Um, 
And we need to value the knowledge and experience of women themselves and provide policy spaces for women to express their knowledge freely and without constraint. And again, I think this goes back to uh, one of the ways in which health systems are highly gendered, that you know, women's, uh, women's knowledge about their own health is frequently um, not recognized by doctors. And there's this kind of big divide between you know, medical knowledge and lay knowledge, and, and it is highly gendered. And again, there's quite a lot of studies that show how that operates in practice. So I think we need to address that as well. And that we need to develop and make use of process indicators that better reflect the broader social dimensions of women's health and support engaged research to develop indicators that reflect a focus on women's rights, for example, around choice. And we also need to learn the historical lessons from this sector. Again, there's a, a very significant body of work that's looked at how um, women's health has been used for instrumental purposes in development, and we need to kind of take that on board and, and ensure that that doesn't happen again. And, and we need to uh, recognize and, and really acknowledge in programs that women's health is fundamentally linked to empowerment and rights. And I will finish there. Thank you very much, uh, Jasmine, particularly the <laughs> emphasis on empowerment and rights, but also some of the tensions um, around these issues. Uh, for example, healthcare is not just a technical issue, it's, it's also a political issue. Um, we have uh, now Natalie, who's going to uh, take us towards the uh, education sector. Natalie is with the Institute for Development Policy and Management at the University of Antwerp, and um, has also been doing a lot of work on um, advising the Belgian Directorate uh, for uh, Development. So, uh, Natalie, welcome. Okay, um, my presentation is on uh, budget support, budget support to the education sector, and looking at ways and how to make this budget support more uh, gender sensitive. So this is the outline of the presentation. I will spend two minutes on each of the bullets, and most of the presentation is in fact in the annexes, but I will not deal with the annexes right now. Okay, what is the context of this presentation? The context is the uh, Paris Declaration, the Busan um, uh, Agreement, and in fact the, um, the, the opportunities and the challenges that are in these declarations. So, um, um, in fact, there, in, in principle, there are opportunities and risks, but what we see that in, is that in practice, um, aid agencies have difficulties in how to handle with this changing aid modalities. Um, it's not that there are no suggestions on how to move forward. There are a couple of useful suggestions that have been made by, amongst others, the OECD DAC, where in fact they show how donors can integrate in different entry points a gender dimension. What I mean, what I mean with this is, for instance, when, um, when donor agencies do an appraisal of countries, of the quality of countries' policies, then in fact they could integrate their uh, gender dimension. They could use a gender scan to in fact see to what extent national policies also integrate a gender dimension. Now, um, the problem with these um, suggestions, or maybe it's not a problem, but until now there has been little research on the effective application of these suggestions. And um, we also know little about the effectiveness of using these uh, suggestions. So this paper focuses on two of these uh, specific suggestions that have been made. One of them is the um, integration of gender indicators in performance assessment frameworks and the use of joint gender working groups in the, uh, as one of the coordination mechanisms among donors and recipient countries. Um, so we look at the application of this and the degree to which this has been effective in different uh, country contexts. We focus on uh, primary education sector and on Sub-Sahara Africa because in fact the, the gap in primary education is still highest in Sub-Sahara Africa, whereas you also have at the same time variation in performance. So conceptual framework, uh, there was no conceptual framework that was readily available, so we had to construct our own conceptual framework. We did that on the basis of different uh, literature streams. Uh, the one we used 
um, was, for instance, the literature on gender mainstreaming by Hafner, Burton, and um, in fact, who is distinguishing among two types of incentives, among hard incentives and among soft incentives. And so we saw, in fact, that it was possible to link the uh, gender targets in performance assessment frameworks. We consider that as a kind of hard incentives and then the use of gender working groups as a more softer type of incentive. Then we also looked at literature on um, aid effectiveness in the education sector, literature on uh, gender and education, and so it finally led to uh, this conceptual framework where we also where we distinguish among these donor entry points, but then also look at some financial indicators, aid financial indicators like aid dependency, and also country context indicators. Uh, which influence, which have been shown to influence uh, outcomes in education. And there we distinguish among those that are more income related on the one hand, and then uh, those that are more dealing with the gender institutional context. Um, the outcomes we have looked at was change in the country's performance on education. We looked here, we selected two indicators. The one is the change in the female net enrollment rate, and the other one is the change in female survival rate, all dealing with primary education. So each of these variables, we have made them operational and we have used databases that already exist. Um, there was no data available, of course, on the use of um, the sex disaggregated indicators in the PAFs and also not on the presence of joint gender working groups. So that is a database that we have constructed ourselves. Um, so the sample of the, of the study were sub-Saharan African countries, those that have received education budget, um, education budget support. And um, yes, there were a couple of data limitations, some countries on which data was not available. And finally, we arrived with a sample of 17 countries. And we have then later on included 15 countries in the analysis. Because the sample was small, so 17 countries, we could not use uh, regression analysis. So we have used qualitative comparative analysis, QCA, which is in fact used for, uh, which is something in between qualitative analysis and quantitative analysis. And um, so it's very useful to identify parts, uh, combinations of conditions that leads to uh, outcomes. Um, okay, so some of the findings. Um, first, in terms of the uh, primary data collection we have done on the use of, um, in, of sex disaggregated indicators in PAF. So of the 17 countries we have looked at, 11 out of them include um, sex disaggregated um, enrollment related indicators. So in fact, 11 out of 17 included some kind of sex disaggregated or gender indicator. Um, nine were on enrollment, eight included um, indicators, sex disaggregated indicators on survival and um, eight countries had other gender indicators. Joint gender working groups were present in 10 out of the 17 countries, and a combination of the two were present in um, seven countries. Um, then of the 15 countries which were included in the analysis, nine out of them had a high performance on increasing female net enrollment in primary education. So we have defined high performance as above the sub-Saharan African average or lower increase, but those that were already above 75% in 2005. Um, and then the outcomes of the QCA analysis. What is important is that um, all six, so we have identified six parts to, um, to high performance on increasing female net enrollment rates, and all these six parts to high performance all, in fact, include the presence of these sex disaggregated indicators and puffs and or these gender uh, working groups. And the, the parts that were most prominent, so that most, if you look at the different parts, the parts that were followed by, by most countries, there were two of them. Uh, one part was a combination of these sex disaggregated indicators and parts together with aid dependency and absence of free education. And I've included the countries between brackets and then 
Uh, the other part to high performance was presence of these joint um, gender working groups, a favorable gender institutional setting for which we use the CG indicator and free education. And then again, included the countries between brackets. Now, um, when we come to the conclusion, um, and this is, these are a couple of other findings from the, from the research, is that the use of incentives, whether it are hard or soft incentives, these, especially, these are especially effective in countries that are aid-dependent. In less aid-dependent countries, national context proves to be more important. What is then national context? It's a favorable gender institutional setting and uh, the presence of free education. If you look at incentives and, and national context, and when national context is supportive, and you have to understand supportive here as where you have that favorable gender institutional setting and where you have free education, joint gender working groups work. But when this national context is less supportive, then these joint gender working, these joint gender groups do not work, but then sex disaggregated indicators and paths work. Um, and then um, a finding which was also interesting is that um, it's often a combination of the two, often a combination of gender indicators and paths together with gender working groups that uh, prove um, to work. Um, that is maybe not so surprising. They are mostly mutually reinforcing. When you have gender working groups, they uh, often stimulate the inclusion of gender indicators in PAFs. When you have gender indicators in PAFs, it's also more likely that they come on the agenda of your joint sector review and of your policy dialogue. And when these are on the agenda, then again, you have a higher probability of those gender working groups to be effectively involved in the uh, in the joint sector working group, in the joint sector reviews. Now, um, finally, um, these, joint gender work, these joint gender groups that exist in, in many countries, um, they are like an easy entry point for donors. Right? So it's, uh, it's, these groups provide neutral spaces for discussion and for collaborative learning among actors that are positioned differently. With this, we mean uh, you have there the actors from within the donor uh, community, but also from within the ministries, from within civil society. And so you create a kind of space in which um, they can exchange um, ideas. And it's also in line with, with what Booth would call the new role for donors. It's a brokerage among state and citizens. It's in fact stimulating um, collective action. Um, when you have these gender working groups, they also are um, able to identify um, indicators to be included in paths that are in fact localized and realistic. So instead of having donors that um, decide on which specific indicator to include, when you work through these working groups, then you get in fact more localized and realistic indicators, which also has an effect on the effectiveness. Um, Another important issue is that, of course, focusing only on indicators is dangerous because then you can uh, have indicatorism and indicators um, can also be considered as an endpoint. But when you link it to these gender working groups, then the probability of um, having real monitoring of these indicators and specifically analysis of the data um, increases. And it also can stimulate feedback and national use of data, which goes beyond, in fact, the use of data by, by donors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Indication there of the importance of data. Um, although uh, you were warning us against indicatorism, I think, as well. So, uh, hello, uh, Ravenborg is from, the, um, from DIES, uh, one of our uh, recon, recon partners. Um, her particular interest is on governance issues, and uh, she's been conducting a great deal of um, field research, including Nicaragua, Colombia, Tanzania, uh, Uganda. Um, and uh, welcome, Ella. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you for staying on this late afternoon. I will try in 10 minutes to uh, summarize the results of not work that I've been doing all on my own, but work that has been done in a team. There's a summary or a synthesis report lying out there. There are two working papers and two more will be coming. 
So I will try my level best uh, to do that in 10 minutes. The issue now is uh, land administration. Sounds a bit like a lot of paperwork, but it's much more than that, I can tell you. The context is this. If we look to sub-Saharan Africa, just to take a case, a big case though, uh, the context is this, that we have more or less labor, gender inequality, men and women contributing the same amount of time to agriculture, um, but no gender inequality when it comes to land ownership. The first set of pie, or the first pie there is labor, and the second one is land. So something is, is not quite the way that some think that it should be at least. That does not mean that women don't have access to land. They do in the many parts of, uh, of Sub-Saharan Africa and also in many other parts of the world. But they have access to land through what you could call secondary land rights. That means that it's conditional not on having a title, but it's conditional on their marital status it's conditional on having children or not, whether they have a good family in law or they don't. And as you can imagine, uh, that type of access to land may be fragile and it may be patchy. The two sets of pies that I've chosen to put there come from a study that we did in Uganda last year. And it shows two different areas in Uganda um, and the the proportion of women having access to land compared to, man, compared to men in the two parts. This is not because the legal or, or the, the, yeah, the legal or the policy context is different in those two areas. It's simply two areas that have different traditions, different cultures, and different views on what is the role of women. So there's a limit to what you can do through, through law and through policy. There has been a lot of um, contributions from donors on the issue of land and gender equality. Um, yeah, the one that, uh, that I wanted you to see is not the one that you see in yellow. It's a different one. Uh, the colors were changed. Um, so you should look, look third from, uh, from the top, which is the gender component. And it's not very visible. I'm very sorry about that. Um, but but this graph shows the different components that have been emphasized by in, in the donor projects that we have been able to retrieve from the eight data database um, relating to land. And there are different sets of uh, issues that those have been dealing with from, um, from capacity building. Um, well, there's some other issues here. Uh, titling, uh, dis dispute resolution, indigenous people's land rights, et cetera. So what you can see is that there's been a, a change in the sense that land administration became much a, a very strong activity after structural adjustment reforms that passed through the 90s. That new approaches rather than land reform, the focus one was on titling and land administration. And gradually also uh, gender was taken into that equation. It was not there from, from the outset, and if you would have a cynical view, you can say that it was introduced at a moment as a glazing on the top, at least to please uh, donors' home communities. And it's still very controversial where it's uh, implemented. The, the important thing is also to say that now gender is part of the considerations that relate to, to land and the way that land is administered, and that donors have been putting pressure for it to be there. It has not come on its own. There have also been achievements in the legal and policy frameworks in the countries. We have uh, pulled out 15 countries that you see listed there. And the 15 countries, or, and uh, we have then uh, looked through the legislation, the type of uh, administrative framework, the policy framework, and we have interpreted then what, does, what do those frameworks say about land and the way it's administered and whether gender is visible in all of this. Again, the colors are not the ones that I chose, but, uh, but uh, you will have to bear with me. 
The, um, the important thing here is to say that in all the 15 countries you can own land individually. Uh, there's also recognition gradually now that customary uh, land tenure should be taken into account and should be recognized also in the laws and, and the regulations that are written down. It's also now so that women in many of the countries, not in all, uh, can own land on her own. And many countries, again, uh, pushed a bit by donors, now have recognition of joint ownership. So joint ownership, having both names on the title, is, uh, is a possibility. What is not here, and I'm afraid you can't see that, is the top yellow one, that customary law towards women's access to land is in agreement with statutory law that we didn't find in any of the 15 countries. And only in two countries we could see that there was affirmative action regarding women's uh, land rights uh, being called for. So, so there's some gaps and there's some room for a further improvement, you can say, and that's, of course, a good story if you like challenges. And what are those challenges then? Well, as I just hinted at, there's one challenge that remains that there are contradictions between what is written in with respect to women's access to land on her own uh, in customary law and in statutory law. That's, that's a challenge. There's not one single, one, one only answer to this, but it's a challenge that remains. It's also a challenge that as you will be very much aware, I guess most of you at least, there's been a push both from donors but also from many countries themselves to move quickly, as quickly as possible towards a formalization and also towards the individualization of land rights. Now, if you remember from one of the first slides, one of the ways that women gain access to land today is through secondary land rights. So by pushing the formalization and the individualization, there's also the risk that that could jeopardize secondary land rights. If I'm a man, remember, imagine, um, and I am giving my wife land, and suddenly that has to be written down on paper how we divide that, it's very likely that I will keep that land to myself and not agree to the fact that my woman uh, my wife could have part of that land written on the piece of paper that we share. So by, by pushing that formalization and individualization, there's a risk that those secondary land rights that women today benefit from, at least to some extent, will be, uh, will be um, lost. The implementation capacity, I think it, it cuts across many sectors, but I think it's very visible that all the laws that we have seen, all the policies, all the nice intentions, all the institutions that we're also trying to imagine to, to make land administration work, um, the, the capacity for implementing that is very low in many places. And it's very sporadic and very often, and I think this is specific if we have a gender focus on the land ad administration issue, it's specifically dependent on NGOs uh, being there to capture at least some of the funding that has been put aside by, by donors uh, to, to pursue and strengthen uh, the land rights of women. And uh, the gender equality with respect to land ownership, the, the desirability of that is a very contested issue. It's very contested politically it's very contested culturally, and it's very contested socially. Politically, in the sense that we have underlying this issue uh, a contradiction and, and a fight for authority and power between customary institutions and statutory institutions and all the economic interests related to that. Culturally, because there's a change in the role of the bigger family, the clan, um, the community, and the, the nuclear family in many societies, uh, not just in Europe, but also wider. And socially, because we are, we are addressing the relationships uh, between men and women, obviously, uh, between women are hesitant to, to take 
and use the rights that are there. They don't want to be seen as pompous. Um, and also because they know that in general life, um, when, when they are in societies where violence against women is not, um, is not um, uh, what do you call that? Um, the word is not punished, uh, then of course it's a risky business uh, insisting on your rights. What are the recommendations then to pursue the gender equality in land and land administration issues? Well, we can see very clearly that this is not something that can be changed just by writing a law, just by writing a policy, just by writing a title. It requires commitment and it requires endurance over time from donors and from all other societal actors who are trying to pursue this, this agenda. That will probably come as no surprise for those of you who have been in this business for many years. Um, it's also requiring much more than just the titles, much more than just the formalization, and much, much more than just having two names on a title. It requires looking beyond land legislation and land institutions. Family law is very important in this context, uh, and it's very contentious. In Ghana, uh, the constitution was written and adopted in 92. It uh, made a specific remark that something had to be done uh, to the legal framework for for property division when, uh, when changes in marriage occur, when, when a husband dies, for instance, it has taken 20 years to get to do that. Not because they had forgotten about it, but because it's contested uh, societally. It requires looking at legal institutions more widely and dispute resolution institutions and obviously focusing on the access of women and men to these institutions. Police, sorry, police institution, the police institution is crucial in this uh, setting. It, it relates, as I hinted at before, to violence in society in general. Not having women police officers, I think we know that even from a society like the Danish society, that if you are met as a woman by a male police officer who don't really think that your problem is worthy of attention, then uh, it discourages you from claiming your rights. It requires efforts, not just nationally, but also locally. Um, these issues are played out in the local arena, so it's obviously insufficient to focus at the national level and the national level institutions. And it requires, because land, at least in sub-Saharan Africa, but also in other places, is to a large extent governed and administered in the customary sphere rather than in the statutory sphere, then it requires attention to both of those spheres where land is, uh, is administered. And I think uh, I'm now echoing the uh, conclusion that many of you have hinted at in the previous presentations, but systematic documentation of the gender equality and inequality and its wider economic and societal implications. We need data to be able to demonstrate not just the importance, uh, not just the extent of the inequality itself, but also of its wider economic and cultural and social implications. And that also goes for the way that donor uh, support is evaluated. If you look through evaluation, it's very rare to come across anything that is written about gender impacts if gender was not in there as a specific objective from the very beginning. And even then, it can be difficult. So with these words and the words of an official from the Tanzanian Ministry of Land who is hinting at this being a long-term uh, endeavor. You can discuss whether it's actually an evolution, but at least, at least it's a change that doesn't come overnight, and we must prepare to, to fight for it and support it uh, with very small steps and very great effort. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.
Thank you very much, uh, LA. Sort of, um, also particularly the, the last quote you know, on the issue of evolution versus revolution. I don't know whether you want to join us. So we're getting, getting a little bit crowded, but I think we're okay. Provided people on that side can still see past us. We're going to have to dip a bit into the coffee break, folks. So I hope you're prepared for that. Okay, so Sergio, I've already introduced you. Um, you're one of the few philosophers that I know, although wider back in the old days had a very strong tradition in philosophy, of course, with Amartya Sen. So you're continuing this in part. So please, welcome. Yes, thank you very much. Oh, and being in the same uh, group with Amartya Sen, that's an honor to be even mentioned in the <laughs> same sentence. And uh, of course, being in Tanzania, I'm uh, used to these technical problems and issues of time, so it's no problem whatsoever. Uh, my paper is uh, focusing on uh, transitional justice and aid. And uh, interestingly, I have to say that the brief you have is from my previous paper, so I will combine previous and current paper, the same presentation. Yeah. So I want to focus on more on the aid and transitional justice processes and the mechanisms. I mean, more and more aid money is now going to the transitional justice issues. And it's very different nowadays to separate the transitional justice uh, funding from the wider reform fundings to the aid, and even more difficult to segregate the gender-based funding in that whole context. Uh, transitional societies and transitional justice processes, they focus on governance, social justice, and uh, equality, improving the society, reconstructing a society towards the democratic development. But my question is here in this paper and in general, are we focusing on appearances or are we actually supporting as a donor community um, change? Are we facing the economic and political realities? Um, I have worked also on the development sector for the Finnish development programs, supporting some of these um, processes. And sometimes um, it appears that the donor side is willing to give up some principles. We talk about certain values and um, democratic principles, but we settle with pseudo democracies. Um, we, we are ready to support processes that are countries that are in transition as long as they have the democratic processes and institutions in place. I'm talking about elections, parliamentary representation, uh, type of uh, media, but however, we are not willing to push the conditionalities much further because of the issues of ownership, equal partnership, and cultural and political sensitivities. Democratic values versus democratic processes. Uh, here I have Kenya and DRC as a case studies, but they are just case studies, and because of the limited time, I think I'd just take a few examples from there, but the pattern seems to be the same in uh, many countries, different countries where the TJ uh, transitional justice processes are funded. Uh, one, uh, the main problem from the gender perspective is, especially in uh, fragile states and transitional societies, that the donor motivations and interests are different from the transitional government interest. I mean, you look at the, uh, what's happening in Egypt now and elsewhere, we discussed about the Arab Middle East, Northern Africa countries earlier. What the Western donor countries would hope the transitional process will achieve is not necessarily at all the same that the political leadership have in mind. For women's rights, this is a difficult situation because women's rights are always set as a yielding rights. Women's rights have to wait until the better time when the other political, religious, cultural, ethnic, racial issues that are seen to have more importance are solved. And then late, um, after that comes the gender equality. However, I argue that it's a very problematic is the gender equality, and as my colleagues were saying here earlier, is set aside in the beginning of the process because if it's added later, it becomes more and more difficult to struggle with and often it becomes a parallel process that is no longer connected to the reforms that are happening otherwise in the country. The main questions 
are also here. Then how do the development partners, the donor countries, learn to operate in a changing global environment of development cooperation? And, and that's the alternatives for liberal democracy. We can have democratic institutions built with the donor assistance, but if the, uh, the mental states and the goals of the partner countries' governments are not with us, those institutions can continue maintaining very um, suppressive and unequal uh, situation in the country or governance system in the country. In this context, how can we find a better approach to enhance women's rights? And what can we learn from the third world or post-colonial feminism? How to take into account all the different levels of injustice that women, especially in the transitional societies, have to deal with? Uh, our colleagues in the previous session brought out very well the issues that women in countries with patriarchal systems or transitional governance systems or reconstruction after conflict have to deal with so many social injustices that the gender issue becomes only one, or gender or women's rights actually, becomes only one issue on the long agenda of injustices. And also women have to deal with the different loyalties. Many conflicts are based on social economic competition, competition on power, but also religious conflict, ethnic conflict. And women in these countries, even if they get into political position, they have subnational loyalties. And they are expected to be on the side of their own ethnic group, their own community, their own political party, the leaders who put them in power, and not necessarily set the women's right as the first priority on the agenda. Uh, the reason we took, or I took here the United Nations Security Council 1325, as an example, women, peace and security, because it's one of the transitional justice programs that is gender focused. It's not gender, peace and security, it's women, peace and security. So it's focusing directly on gender and improving women's position. Uh, I said Kenya and uh, DRC are here just an examples, and I don't go into details. I took those because I have been partly involved myself in the processes uh, on the support to the national action plans in these countries. However, I think many countries have the similar challenges and issues in uh, implementing the Security Council resolution. First of all, the Council resolution is very important. It has taken into agenda the women's role in conflict and improving women's uh, possibilities to participate. However, at the same time, it has made it a parallel agenda to the other reforms uh, in a reconstruction, especially after conflict. Um, in Kenya, or oh, the trends are the same in the many countries, it becomes easily a parallel process to other efforts and other reform programs. In Kenya, um, around the same time, uh, when I was there, we had the big justice sector reform program, we had the public sector reform program, we had gender and governance program, we had lots of uh, agricultural reform programs, and then started the 1325, Women, Peace and Security and also constitutional reform program. And at the same time, the promotion that 1325 does for women's participation, not only reconstruction after conflict or in the conflict situation or transitional, but also being part of women in building societies with conflict could be prevented. Having the gender right as the primary right and primary Gender, right on, um, gender justice as the primary basics for building any other social justice. If you don't get the gender justice right in the beginning, it's very difficult to reform, to improve, to correct the other structural long-time injustices that actually lead to conflict and new conflicts. 
But if it remains a parallel process, then it's very problematic. Uh, women's representation as numbers, I already mentioned, that's not enough as such. Women's participation, empowerment, or actual, actual influence in the processes, not just being selected as a representative of um, gender, but also representatives of a bigger reform and having a chance to have their voice heard. But often this is not in the interest of the leaders in the transitional societies. In many cases, it happens to be, happens to be men who don't see this process as a priority. There's a lack of uh, political will. Uh, internationally, of course, uh, there is the political commitment, rhetorically speaking. But then when it comes to actual implementation of the resolution, then the lack of political will is disappearing fast and the budget for the implementation are also diminishing. I was trying to look for very exact economic data, how much money the donors are giving for the implementation of 1325, how much uh, the countries in question put in budget, and it's almost impossible to find because it involves so many processes. And sometimes the donor processes also, they go on top of the processes that are already taking place in this country. The organization in the grassroots level already working on the issues of gender-based violence, uh, women's participation in solving conflicts, women's participation in political, uh, um, or women's political participation in different levels. But introducing something external as a very abstract process of numbers is not always taking into account all the um, processes that are already going on in the country. Changing development, the cooperation context, and that's what I started with, the transitional issues. Development policies and shared objectives. Um, 1325 and the national action plans, they are just one example where we make an agreement with a partner country where we set some ideals these are the ideals from a liberal democracy, talking about equality, uh, individual rights, uh, gender justice included there, and we agree in principle. But when it comes to the implementation, then we are not necessarily on the same space anymore. And because the um, monitoring has not been as consistent as it should be, and, uh, and the more following up with the results has also been lacking behind. We sometimes end up being on the two different, um, two different lines, and the women are the ones who are losing in this process. Uh, also changing context is the countries we were talking about, emerging economies, and China, India, Russia, the BRICS in general, coming to the traditionally Western development scenery. We don't know what to deal with them. Even here today we were talking, well, what about China as a donor? But China and the BRICS, they are more and less coming from the market background. Investment, foreign direct investments. African countries are rising with the natural resources, everything available. The whole scenery of the donor cooperation is moving very rapidly. The values that we have been offering more or less as the conditions of aid and as the goals of a transitional processes in development, they are losing their importance. The countries, the BRICS, are not necessarily setting these same conditions. They are actually working more on the market-based economy which the traditional Western donors have been imposing on the develop as a model for development for a long time. And now it's taken over by the emerging economies and we don't know anymore what to do in that context. We talk about the values, but are we ready to actually hold on to those values? Because at the same time, we have the changing situation in Europe. The economy in Europe is not doing so well, or in West in general, including US. How much are we willing to give up on the ideals that we set as the goals for our development policies, especially when it comes to the gender issues? Because we tend to say, I say that the gender has to, give prior, uh, has to give away to other priorities. And many donor partners are not willing to push because they feel it's culturally too sensitive, politically 
yeah, conclusion, politically too sensitive, and also we might lose our own economic opportunities. We want to respect the partner countries' uh, ownership so much that we are willing to compromise our own ideals in many cases, and the gender justice is one of them that we are more, most likely willing to give up. All the good action plans are often staying in the closet. It's good, the government has accepted them. However, the implementation is no longer our business. Thank you. Okay, so we're uh, a little bit into the coffee break, but I'd just like to take uh, some time now for some, uh, some reflections on what we've heard, some very rich presentations across all the sectors. Quite interesting, because um, you know, we've, we've got sort of technocratic visions here. Uh, we've got some tensions between the rights and the instrumental instrumentalism. Can't say the word, even, that Karen brought out this morning. Um, and uh, also then the circuit was reminding us, well, you know, don't we also have a, perhaps a little bit of hypocrisy um, kicking around in some of this um, debate? So I'd like to take uh, some interventions from the floor. Could we start on uh, this side of the, uh, the floor, please? Do we have some interventions from this side of the floor? Or indeed, we, do we have some interventions from the other side of the floor? Yeah, Leon. And since we don't have other interventions, I can get your full attention for 45 minutes. <laughs> um, one, one of my, my first comment is on the, on the land issue. Um, I think it's a, it's a big, big issue in, uh, in all African countries. But one thing I wanted to you to comment on is the political economy aspect of land administration. I give you a, a, very, a very simple example. One is the implications of land titling on the distribution of political power along ethnic, along ethnic lines. Uh, and a, a clear example is Ethiopia. One of the, my own interpretations, one of the problems of the Tigrayan political uh, uh, regime against land titling is because if you do that on a one-to-one -one basis, then that means wealth falls in the hands of the Oromo, who, do, who are not, who are not the, the dominant regime. So how do you manage that? The, the second question is, you talked about the <clears throat> uh, formalization and indiv individualization of, of land titles, which is a, it's a, it's a very important distinction. And my fear, uh, in addition to the concerns you raised, is that in the individualization of land titles actually is going to, to generate lots of landless people because people are going to sell their land because they, have, they don't have money and so on. Whereas if you, you go on the family, uh, at the family level, which is what the most, the biggest practice now, at least you have, you guarantee that land is going to, not going to be alienated. But then how do you protect individual rights within that family uh, arrangement, uh, the rights of, of women, also of, of orphans who may have different parents from different, different, uh, different uh, origins. Um, the, uh, on the, uh, the last presentation about the, do, the donor practices, the dark and the what we call traditional and non-traditional donors, in fact, sometimes we, when we comment and um, discuss the, the aid practices of the non-traditional donors, the emerging donors, and that the fact that they are not ad adopting the dark processes, and yet we have spent the whole day lamenting on the fact that these processes are not good. So, <laughs> so do we want the new ones to adopt the, the, old, the old practices which are not good? That's a good point, Leon. So a question here of standards or double standards. So, Roger. Thank you. I was um, interested in particularly in where Circu was ending up. And I want to ask you, Circu, is the, um, what has been uh, codified as uh, action, pl uh, action plans from the northern donors and international organizations? Is that a women's agenda? Or is that, you know, for example, colleagues in Tanzania, Tanzanian women, do they have a different 
African women's agenda from a first world or globalized agenda? Uh, or do they feel completely represented by the action plans coming from the North and from the international organizations? Uh, thank you very much. I want to address the issue of uh, conflict and the fragility of women, girls, and children in it, and refer to 1325. Uh, the Secretary General of the UN has already pronounced that 15% of UN managed funds will be spent on implementation of 1325. I think that it was mentioned that you were not able to find how much money is being uh, given under ODA for uh, women in conflict. Is it possible that we appeal to the donor community that they match that 15% which the UN is giving? Because you did mention, and you didn't talk about it, the twinning process. What was the twinning process that you were referring to but did not elaborate on it. My second question is that we had the, um, con uh, a slide which showed contraception and talk about the tensions in it. Can we agree, and if we can't, can we get together and be pulled together by UN wider and sit down and thrash this out? Because I thought after the Cairo, after the Cairo conference, uh, the reason for my saying is we have to come to closure on this very politicized issue. It's politicized. And too many women are dying. Too many are suffering. And as you have pointed out, you still had a whole chart showing the, uh, the tensions that are found around it. Uh, I thought that Cairo conference had settled this issue where we agreed uh, that uh, abortion was not a method of family planning and unsafe abortion would be addressed. And yes, I think we have learned as a, as a world to live with the MCP of the United States. So I think we need to come to closure on this issue and put family planning and contraceptive back on that radar screen. Thank you very much. Okay, so there are no other questions or comments. Ah, the lady um, over there, who um, I'm not sure you've had an answer to your question in the morning yet on Malawi, so if any of the panel yeah. here I, I did get, um, on that? I did get a very interesting uh, comment from, um, now I can't remember, but the lady who made her presentation and included examples from Bangladesh okay. and Pakistan, right. and mm. we have since then had a very interesting discussion. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, to the panel. My name is Lynn Lichwana Carlton from the Swedish University of Agriculture Sciences. Um, Sirka, I really like your presentation, especially the last uh, food for thought, I would call it. You stated the following things that I think we should put on the table and think a little bit more about them. One of them was, are Western values losing to new partnerships? And the second was that Africa is rising, given its uh, resources that it has. And I'd like to add one more thing, and that is perhaps in thinking about our Western values losing to new partnerships and Africa rising, perhaps where are the African voices as well? If we want to continue to have a discussion, where do we put the African voices in these partnerships, especially when it comes to Western values? In fact, I think um, the, the uh, issue of developing country voices, uh, including African voices, can apply to every one of our um, panel. I had a specific question on, on um, your presentation, Natalie. That the, um, you know, the uh, obviously there's a very powerful case for education as a driver of growth, and to a degree you can convince a finance minister around that, perhaps rather than the rights-based approach. So, I don't know. Is, is, is the rights-based approach just simply chit-chat? I'd be provocative at this stage. Okay, so, panel, can we go back and, uh, Helle, let's start with you. you a specific question on, on land. Yeah, and if I could answer that one. <laughs> um, and indeed, any other point you want to make. Yeah. yeah. 
the political economy of land and how do you manage that? Um, I can't answer that one. <laughs> but it's obviously, and it's increasingly, I would say, but, but even that would be a lie because if you look back 100 or 200 years in history, the political, the political economy of land was still already back then a contentious issue. So obviously it is a very strong issue and obviously it's an econ economic issue on top of being an ethnic and political issue. And, and so I'll have to leave it there because it would make no sense that I could make an answer to that one. The other one, uh, the other comment that you made was about uh, this trend towards formalization and individualization and what that would lead to. Now you have your interpretation, I also have mine, and I would like to share my interpretation here. My interpretation is this, that whatever system you have to, to protect and within which to have authority for your claims and your rights to land, it requires some resources. You need to master some resources in able to have effective access to land. Some, issue, some systems require economic resources, some systems require legal literacy. Uh, some systems require that you actually can go and have your paper written. And other systems, and now we are, that was a formalization bit, and the other system that seems to be out there is a system that relies on you being in a specific place, belonging to a specific group, and maintaining relationships to specific people. Different sectors or parts of society have strengths or comparative advantages in the different systems. And obviously that will dictate what would be the consequent of pushing one more than the other. And I agree very much with your interpretation that if you rush very quickly towards an individualization and formalization just within maybe 10 years or so, there's a great likelihood that many of the people who today have access to resources, to land, will lose that access simply because they don't master the resources that are required to enter and gain your access to land through that other new system. If that's what we want to see, then go ahead. But if it's not what we want to see, then something should be done about it. That doesn't solve the other problem, that there are lots of issues and there are lots of um, inequalities within the present state of access to land. And, and that's also what you're hinting at, and I very much agree, agree with that. And therefore, I think it's, it's, a, it's extremely important that there now are tendencies towards seeing if we can have coexistence between the different systems, and also if we can, to some extent, codify, to some extent, make what was not visible to the outside before now visible to the outside by registering, not necessarily by individualizing, but at least making the two systems able to talk to each other. I think that's a, an important trend, and that a trend that needs to be supported. We can't abolish one or the other system. Okay, thank you. One more, one more thing. Uh, the, the dispute resolution mechanisms, I think, are extremely important in this context and are extremely important also in relation to your first, um, your first observation about the political economy, because this is a, a conflict of interest. And if you don't have any institutions for dealing with those conflicts, it will blow out to something that we don't want to see. So dispute resolution and being able to live with duality, or maybe even more than duality, uh, and having those systems talk to each other, I think that will be crucial, both for men and for women and for societies. Conflict brings to Circu, that's to Circu, and uh, you had fair a bit of, a bit of support from the audience, it seems, uh, on what you were saying, Circu. Are you going to agree? Okay, thank you very much for the comments and the support and the questions. And I want to start with the Africa Voices, because that is a very interesting question now. Uh, what is happening. Who is the one who speaks on behalf of Africa nowadays, especially when it comes to the, in relation to women's rights and women's equality? You have been probably following the ICC case of Kenya and the big um, push from the AU, African Union, to get further and further away from the international justice systems and the international relating also to human rights conventions and agreements over there what we have had at the universal level, 
Now there's a big push from Africa, African leaders, African current leaders, who most of them are male, saying these are not our values. Our voices are different. We have our own mechanisms. We have our own values. We don't want to take this Western pushed system of international justice, Western universalized values. So what are African values? And the African leaders, are they speaking on behalf of all Africa? I don't know. As far as I know, most women and my colleagues back in Tanzania and Kenya don't think that these processes should be stopped. They think the Western countries are actually sometimes speaking more on behalf of the Africans than the African leaders. But that's a very good question. Where do we get there? And are women's rights universal values? Or are they Western values? And how can, they make, how can they be made to be universal, more universal values? Or are we giving up on that? Are we going on the cultural relativism and say, okay, well, some countries don't respect the same values as what we would like them to in order for us to give development aid. So either we drop them or we have to respect the ownership and let them do the way they want to do it. And that is where we have to look at ourselves as donors. What do we want to do? How much do we want to give in? What does ownership mean in the end? Is it cultural relativism? The second question, which was about twinning process. Um, and I'm very sorry the paper was probably very disconnected because it was <laughs> combining two papers. But if you read them, they're all as a working papers. So you can get them from the wider websites. I, was, um, I wrote quite a bit about the twinning process. Finland was a twinning partner with Kenya. And the twinning process has uh, the idea that the northern, part, northern country is um, partnering with the often southern partner country who is working on the 1325 national action plan. And twinning process is supposed to be mutual learning process. That also the northern countries who are funding the process or mostly at least partly funding the process are learning from their southern partners issues that they can take into account also when planning to the other gender programs. Uh, but unfortunately, what I have seen from the twinning is quite random. The partners are chosen randomly, more or less depending on the northern, northern donor countries. Where do you have the resources? Where do you have the people? What interest, political, other interests you might have in that country? So the partnership is not based on really serious <laughs> mutual agreement it is sometimes pushed to the partner country, unfortunately. Uh, but it's an interesting process, and if you read the paper, you can uh, learn more about that. 15%, um, maybe? Good idea. <laughs> National action plans, are they same uh, from the countries? Uh, do the countries have the same action plans as the donors? Interesting question again. Sometimes it's pushed donor agenda. Sometimes the government might have very different uh, ideas what the country should do than the donor countries. Sometimes the NGO agenda might be closer to the donor countries. I mean, it's a very mm. mixed bag. Okay, thank you, Sergei. Now, we're, we're running a lot over time so at this stage. If anyone wants to slip out and grab a cup of coffee, you're very welcome, but we're gonna continue here with uh, Jasmine's response. So if you're desperate for the job, I'll just go and grab one. So, Jasmine. Okay. All right, well, I'll, I'll keep it brief. Just to say, yes, I, I agree that the whole issue of contraception is critical, and I think one of the main limitations is that the question of reproductive rights sometimes gets forget, forgotten about and, um, and obviously contraception is highly politicized and I think we need to engage in, in, in those elements of the debate as well as the practical elements. So. Okay. And Natalie, I, uh, I had question. this this provocative thing about chit-chat versus uh, persuading your hardened, hard-bitten finance minister. Um, well, I don't think it's so much related to my paper, but um, the, the, the link that there is maybe is that um, it's, it's not so difficult to have um, sex disaggregated uh, uh, indicators on, on education in a PUF. Uh, that's also the only sector on which we could do that research was on the education sector, yeah. because in the other sectors, you hardly find sex disaggregated uh, indicators and so you could ask a question as to why is it that it is easy to have it in the education sector but not at all mm. in land or in or in agriculture mm. and that's maybe the reason why it is is maybe because there is also the the whole argument about effectiveness mm. and efficiency which makes it mm. more maybe more acceptable for some for some fractions within the donor agencies 
to have it included. Mm. Mm. And all, it's also less sensitive in the sense, and there is a link with country ownership, less sensitive to have these sex disaggregated education indicators, uh, less sensitive than you, you would have uh, like sex disaggregated indicators mm. for the agriculture. Mm. And indeed, I thought your point about the data really showed actually that instrumentalism and universalism is not necessarily in, in conflict. Okay, so I think we've had a very stimulating session. Sorry, guys, we ran over a bit of time, but uh, coffee is outside. Quickly grab one, come back in. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for our presenters. <laughs>